Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Heights Baptist Church. We're glad you're here today. If you would take your hymnals and stand, turn to page 380 in your hymnals. Page 380. We'll sing all four verses of Revive Us Again. Page 380. Give everybody a second to get there. Page 380, Revive Us Again. All four verses. Sing it out on that first verse. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus. Please remain standing. Today's reading is a responsive reading in our hymnal, number 428. <laughs> number 428 in the hymnal. So I think we'll just read it through, all of us together, as we did last week. It's not many verses. Seeking Wisdom from James and Proverbs, number 428, as we begin. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come to you once again today, Lord. We know, Lord, that you never get tired of hearing from us, so we come to you as often as we desire to. 
And Father, as you come here today, we pray that your blessings will be upon this hour and this people gathered here together. Both members and visitors alike, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and our very souls, that your perfect will might be accomplished. We thank you, Father, for Brother Brian and his faithfulness to serve you all these years. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless him this day and this time. Lord, I give him the words to speak. You've already laid upon his heart and he's prepared this message to speak to us that we might receive it by faith and do it by faith. Lord, help us to understand the importance of missions and getting the gospel around the world. So many times, Lord, we just think about ourselves and our communities. But Father, there are souls all over the world souls who need saved and through the missions and through those who give themselves to go and preach we might reach them father help us to be and do our part in doing that that work bless our pastor and brother ben there in georgia give them a good day in the lord and bless his church and father we just ask that you would bless this hour again that every word every spoken Every song sung, every thought, every work, I bring you glory and honor and praise. For we ask it in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Take your hymnals, if you would. Turn to page 353. Page 353, Bringing in the Sheaves. It's talking about sowing the gospel and reaping the harvest of being souls. Bringing in the sheaves, page 353. We'll sing all three verses. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the Great singing this morning. And at this time, the choir is going to sing a song entitled, Who Will Go? Who Will Go? Thank you. 
Amen. Let's all stand and take your hymnals again. Turn to page 363. Page 363. Jesus saves. Page 363. We'll go ahead and sing all four of these verses as well. Page 363 on the first verse. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death, they did this life. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the Lord for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus says, Jesus says, let the nations now rejoice. Amen. Shout salvation, full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus says. Saves. Amen. Great singing. You know, the number one thing, problem I have when pastor is away is going from singing to making announcements <laughs> because I'm out of breath. It's just like, oh. <laughs> so give me a second here to catch my breath. You got to sing it out. I mean, you got to sing it out, especially if you're the music director. I mean, hey, you got to sing it out for the glory of God. Well, I just want to say thank you for all our visitors that are here with us today. We appreciate you uh, being with us for the services. Um, Brother Nick and uh, Ali are, are sick today. They uh, got the stomach bug that's going around. So for those of you, uh, well, everybody be careful. You know, we're already not shaking hands, but uh, make sure you wash your hands, all that stuff. Um, it's just like, it seems to be like a 24-hour bug kind of thing, but... Uh, yeah, they got it. So, the pastor's out, and Brother Nick left me. So, I mean, it's 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 just me holding down the fort today, I suppose. But uh, yeah, pastor is away. They're in uh, uh, noon in Georgia right now, preaching a missions conference. Well, they're not preaching, but pastor's preaching a uh, missions conference for Brother Ben Springer, um, who uh, we we trained here at the church, and obviously y'all know. But just playing for some visitors, we trained here at the church, and they moved out there uh, following God in uh, September. And uh, they've been out there ever since. So uh, pastors uh, there with them today preaching the conference. And then they'll be headed down to uh, uh, northeast Florida to see his parents. And then headed back, uh, I believe, beginning of next week. So they'll be, they'll be down there uh, for a little bit. But uh, um, just a couple uh, uh, other things. We're having the yard sale, uh, the uh, church yard sale here in a couple weeks. That's uh, in your bulletins for... Uh, um, well, I guess I should look at the dates here. Let me see. May 17th through the 22nd. Um, so the, the, the sale days are the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you can bring your items starting in May. I know a few of y'all have been asking me, like, hey, we've got a, we've got a garage full of stuff. When can we uh, clean out our house? Um, starting in May, you can go ahead and bring your stuff up here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, list that for sale and price everything. And uh, all the uh, the income from that will be uh, all the re the funds raised from that will be going to uh, youth and uh, those for camp. Uh, master schedules out in the four years, so make sure you you stop by and grab that uh, up. Um, also, wanted to say a word of congratulations today to a man that told me that he was never going to get married. 
But, uh, <laughs> but lo and behold, uh, Mark Allen, son of uh, Brother David and, and Miss Marion, got engaged and they're getting married uh, May 20, 22nd. Okay, so when, yeah, whenever we have the yard sale, they're getting married. Uh, <laughs> so congratulations uh, to them. And uh, <laughs> did not mean anything by that. But I just, like, Pastor wanted me to, to, to announce that I congratulate y'all. Um, also, um, I just, with, uh, with Brother Nick, you know, they're, they're sick and all uh, today. But uh, they've been looking for uh, apartments in the area. I just wanted to mention this. Um, uh, because whenever both, uh, Brother Joseph and Miss Abby Robb, who just had their, their baby boy on Friday, uh, Nehemiah James Judson, Right? Okay. Nehemiah James Judson, uh, seven pounds, 11 ounces, if I remember right. They just had their boy. But they'll be moving down here end of May and joining the staff. Uh, they got to have somewhere to live. So they're going to move into the small side of the apartment. And Brother Nick and Miss Leah, they're going to uh, rent another apartment uh, somewhere else. And they've been looking all over at apartments and looking at prices and everything. And since I've moved down here, which was 2018, I was looking for apartments. Rent has gone up tremendously since then. And a few years ago, it was wise to build a staff apartment. Now, that idea looks brilliant. Like, seriously, seriously, that is a brilliant move on, on the part of the pastor because apartments right now, you're, you're looking at 1,200 minimum for one bedroom apartment in, in the Wiley area. Brilliant move. Brilliant move, and that's, that's been a huge blessing. I mean, I was just thinking about, like, with, for Brother Joseph, graduating Bible college and moving down here. Um, you don't really save a lot when you're in Bible college, so it's not like you've got a really big piggy bank. Um, trying to rent an apartment coming straight out of Bible college would be near impossible. Um, so that, yes, brilliant move, building that apartment back there. Uh, I just wanted to say that because it's, it's just a, a huge blessing uh, for, for them and for us. Um, okay, I think that's all of my announcements, uh, except for the very last one, Brother David Bryant and Miss, okay, Vicki, right? Okay, it's, it's been a couple years, but I was like, I'm pretty sure her name is Miss Vicki. They're with us here today, and they're no strangers to New Heights, and uh, I think last time you were preaching here was, I think it was two years ago, if I'm right, 2019? Take you, okay, yeah. Uh, Pastor was gone then too, so um, anyway, but uh, we're excited to have them there, uh, them here today preaching for us. Again, Brother Dave is going to be preaching. Uh, I don't think, Miss Vicki, I don't think you're going to be preaching today. Um, but we're excited to have them there. Um, Brother Bryant's the pastor of New Testament Baptist Church over in Pantego, uh, Texas, over near Arlington. And uh, we're excited to have them here today. But let's go ahead and pray for the service, and then you all may be seated, and Brother Garrett is going to come sing a special for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, just a place to worship uh, you and glorify you. Um, just be with uh, Brother Garrett as he comes to sing, Brother Brian as he preaches uh, your word to us. And be with us as we're in the middle of our missions conference. Help us just keep our focus on souls and missions, both at home and abroad. And Lord, uh, just uh, give us the heart and the, uh, the desire, the purpose we need to do that. And uh, Lord, we just thank you again for the service. Bless the blessed remainder of it, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated, and the guys can sing. presence I cannot run from your love you're behind me and before me underneath and up above the darkness and the light are both the same to you I couldn't hide from your spirit even if I wanted to my Emmanuel you are with me oh Emmanuel there's nowhere you won't be if I take the wings of the morning or fall into the 
deepest sea, even there, even there, you are with me. If I ascend up to heaven, or make my bed below, I know your hand will hold me wherever I may go. Before I was formed, you already knew my days. Lord, I have no secrets. You know every path I take. My Emmanuel, you are with me. Oh, Emmanuel, there's nowhere you won't be. If I take the wings of the morning or fall into the deepest sea, even there, even there, you are with me. How precious are your thoughts, oh God, they're always on me, more in number than the sand. Oh, how great your love must be, my Emmanuel, you are with me. There's nowhere you won't be. If I take the wings of the morning or fall into the deepest sea, even there, Lord, even there, you are with me. If I take the wings of the morning or fall into the deepest sea, even there, Lord, even there, you are with me. Well, that's good singing, and that's a good song, and I appreciate good singing and good songs. I've been preaching now 51 plus years. I've preached after bad singing and bad songs, <laughs> and I'd much rather preach after good singing and good songs, and I appreciate that. I appreciate you, Pastor, asking me to come and be with you today and preach for your Mission Emphasis Month. And once again, I'm here and he's gone. <laughs> I don't think he likes my preaching. <laughs> Seems like the only time he wants me to come over here and preach is when he's gone. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love you all. I love you, preacher. I appreciate what you're doing in this part of the world. I appreciate his uh, confidence in asking me to come and fill his pulpit. You know, most of us independent fundamental Bible, even Baptist preachers are pretty uh, particular about who we let in our pulpits. And I know this is an honor and a privilege. My wife and I are glad to be here with you uh, to uh, emphasize missions once again in your missions month. This is also our missions month. Every April, we emphasize missions. And I had a missionary the first Sunday in this month, and a missionary last Sunday. We'll have a missionary tonight and a missionary the last Sunday of the month. And we too are a mission-minded church. You're not a true New Testament church if you're not a mission-minded church. And so I want to say thank you once again to New Heights Baptist Church. You helped us ten and a half years ago when we started the New Testament Baptist Church over in Pantego. You were one of our supporting churches your pastor, his dear wife, and a number of folks from your church came to be in our very first service ten and a half years ago. We're still using the uh, sound system that you folks bought for us when we started our church. And uh, <coughs> like you, 
We're a mission-minded church. We're helping now support 50 missionary endeavors. That includes three new churches in the states, one starting up in Michigan, one up in Kansas, and one, believe it or not, out in the area of San Francisco. God knows they need some churches in San Francisco. And so uh, we thank you for your help with our church uh, so long ago now, ten and a half years. And uh, we're still going. We're seeing some people saved. I baptized one last Sunday. And like I said, we're emphasizing missions this month too. Although we ought to emphasize missions, you know, every, every week, and we do. But uh, it seems like we have special times of the year where we have special emphasis in April is our special emphasis on missions, just like yours. Now then, before I ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning, I brought along something hopefully to make you smile. I've always noticed when I come over here to preach that there's a, a number of couples that are members of the church, and that's a good thing. And uh, I found this the other day, I thought I might share it with you this morning, from young people. On how do you decide who's that that's getting ready to get married? How do you decide who to marry? <laughs> Alan, age 10. You got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dips coming. <laughs> Kristen. Age 10 was asked, how do you decide who to marry? Christian age 10 says, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all the way before and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek said, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> Lori, age eight, she was asked, what do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori said, both don't want any more kids. <laughs> Lynette, age eight, was asked, what do most people do on a date? Lynette said, dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> Y'all will like this when Pam, age seven, she was asked, when is it okay to kiss someone? She said, when they are rich. <laughs> then let me give you two more. Anita, age nine, was asked, is it better to be single or to be married? Annette, age nine, said, it's better for girls to be single but not for boys. Boys need someone to clean up after them. <laughs> and then last of all, you'll love this one, Ricky. Smart boy, eight years old, eight years old. Ricky was asked, how do you make a marriage work? He said, tell your wife that she looks pretty even if she looks like a dump truck. <laughs> there you go, folks about ready to be married. There's just some answers for the days ahead. <laughs> All right, enough of this. Now, don't count that on my preaching time. <laughs> Turn on your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. And in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, I want you to notice with me beginning in verse number 19, 1 Corinthians 9 in verse number 19, the Apostle Paul said, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without law, but then he adds in parenthesis, 
being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. He said to them that are without law is without law, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. I want you to notice especially that last part where he said, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Now, the Apostle Paul was one of the very first two God-called, local church-sent missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. And we read about that in Acts chapters number 13 and 14. And the Apostle Paul had a heart for God. The Apostle Paul had a heart for the gospel. The Apostle Paul had a heart for the souls of men. And so he said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I believe if Paul were here among us today and we were to say to Paul, pick out a song we need to sing today, Paul would probably say, let's sing this. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from the sin in the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for thy labors the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. And that's the title of my message to you this morning, Rescue the Perishing. Today's emphasis, this month's emphasis here in your church is, of course, missions. And our responsibility as Christians with regards to missions, whether that be what we call home missions or whether that be what we call foreign missions. Someone said, and I agree, missions is not an extra. It's the acid test as to whether or not you really believe the gospel. Amen. The poet said, Lord, give to me thy love for souls, for lost and wandering sheep, that I may see the multitudes and weep as thou didst weep. Help me to see the tragic plight of souls far off in sin. Help me to love and pray and go to bring the wandering in. From off the altar of thy heart, take thou some flaming coals. Then touch my life and give me, Lord, a heart that's hot for souls. O fire of love, O flame divine, make thy abode in me. Burn in my heart and burn evermore till I burn out for thee. William Carey, that great missionary to India, said, To know the will of God, you need an open Bible and an open map. Someone else, Oswald J. Smith, said, We talk of the second coming while half of the world has never heard of his first coming. Amen. Carl F. Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Missions, rescue the perishing. I want to remind all of us, the greatness of a church is not determined by how many it seats. It's determined by how many it sins. And I fear in too many places today, in too many churches today, the great commission has become the great omission. And you need to make sure here at New Testament... No, no. New Heights Baptist Church. And we need to make sure over at New Testament Baptist Church that we keep the Great Commission first and foremost Amen. in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in our efforts. Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. The songwriter said, there's a call comes ring o'er the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. I want you to think with me today about Paul's words. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. 
And I want you to think with me about this theme, Rescue the Perishing. Why should we be involved in this business, if you will, to rescue the perishing? We need to be involved in this, number one, because quite simply, sinners are perishing. Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now there in John 3, 16, where Jesus said that we should not perish, the, the, the original language of, of the Greek in the New Testament, that word is Apollo me. And if you look it up, Perish, should not perish, Apollo me. If you look it up, it quite simply means to destroy. It means to put out of the way entirely. It means to give over to eternal misery in hell. It means to be lost. Jesus said that he came and he lived for us and he died for us. And he was going to rise from the dead for us so that we would not be put out of the way entirely. So that we would not be given over to the eternal flames of hell. So that we would not be lost. So that we would not be destroyed. He said in Luke 13 verse 3, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish, be destroyed, given over to eternal misery in the flames of hell, put out of the way entirely. Sinners are perishing. Now if we had to stand by and watch people being thrown into a furnace of fire every day, we'd be greatly disturbed. And, that, and yet that's what's happening. Every day, all across the globe. It happens on a daily basis. People are being put out of the way entirely. People are being given over to the flames of an eternal hell. Sinners, I say, are perishing. You and I need to understand this. There are 150,000 people that die every day. That's 6,250 people every hour. That's 105 people every minute. And almost every one of them are slipping off into the flames of an eternal hell. Now I know that be true because Jesus said in Matthew 7, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. The vast majority of the people who die every day, according to the words of Jesus Christ, are lost. They're perishing. They're slipping off into an eternal hell. And hell is a real place. Some people say, I don't believe in hell. You won't be dead two seconds till you believe in hell. Some people say, I don't believe in hell. Well, Jesus said in Luke 16, hell is a real place. And he gives to us the documented story of a man who died and went to hell. And he said, in hell he lift up his eyes and he said, I am tormented in these flames. Jesus said in Mark chapter number 9 that the place we call hell is a place where the fire is not quenched. And the soul of man never dies. You need to understand that Jesus until you get to the last two chapters of the Bible, until you get to Revelation 21 and 22, Jesus only described heaven twice. While at the same time you read the Gospels, he described hell 14 times. Jesus only described heaven twice when he said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt or steal away. And then he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Those are the only two times Jesus described heaven until you get to Revelation 21 and 22. But 14 times he described hell. Hell is a real place, my dear friends. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament. And in those 260 chapters, 234 times, judgment in hell is described. Out of 260 chapters, 234 times, judgment in hell is mentioned. Now, if you were going down the highway on a 260-mile trip, and on that 260-mile trip, you saw 234 signs warning of danger ahead. I bet you'd start paying attention. Well, as we take this trip through the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 234 warnings about judgment and hell. I want to tell you, my friends, sinners are perishing. 
We need to be involved in this business of home missions and foreign missions. We probably ought to think about hell more than we do. The Bible has a lot to say about hell. Let me give you a biblical description. The Bible said in Luke 16, hell is a place of torments. The Bible says in Matthew 25, hell is a place of everlasting punishment. The Bible says in Matthew 25, hell is a place of everlasting fire. The Bible says in Matthew 13, hell is a place where people wail. The Bible said in Revelation 14 verse 11, hell is a place where there's no relief and no rest. He said, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. The Bible says in Revelation 14 that hell is a place where the wrath of God is experienced. The Bible said in Matthew 25 that hell is a place where the devil and his angels are. The Bible says in Revelation 21 that hell is a place of undesirable company. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, these are the people that will be in hell, fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Hell is a place of undesirable company. The Bible said in Luke 16, hell is a place where men will remember. The Bible said in Luke 16, hell is a place where people will plead for mercy. The Bible said in Luke 16, hell is a place where the inhabitants thereof do not want their loved ones to come. The Bible has a lot to say about hell, and you and I must never forget this. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are slipping off and perishing in this place called hell every day, and there's only one remedy. And we have it. And we are responsible with regards to what we do with it. Only one remedy. That's why Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. My dear friends, there was a day and a time and a place when yours truly was on the road to perishing. I was lost and without Christ. But somebody cared. And three of my GI buddies who badgered me every day about my lifestyle and about going to church with them. And I finally said one Wednesday, if I go to church with you guys tonight, will you leave me alone? Amen. And they said yes. And I went that night and I heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And God did a miracle of grace in my heart and in my life. And I trusted Jesus as my Savior that night. My life was changed for good forever. Why? Because somebody cared about me. And they had the only remedy. Now, beloved, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. And I'm supposed to care about others. And I'm supposed to share with others the remedy. Yes, the songwriter said, Throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother who someone should save somebody's brother oh who then will dare to throw out the lifeline his peril to share throw out the lifeline with hand quick and strong why do you tarry why linger so long see he is sinking oh hasten today and out with the lifeboat away then away throw out the lifeline to danger fraught men sinking in anguish where you've never been Winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. Soon will the season of rescue be o'er. Soon they will drift to eternity's shore. Hasten then, my brother, no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them today. I want to tell you, rescue the perishing, number one, because sinners are perishing. Rescue the perishing, number two, because God is commanding. Again, in Mark 16, 15, the last words of Jesus, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The last words of Jesus in John 20, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The last words of Jesus, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The last words of Jesus, go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Every believer, are you a believer today? Amen. Every believer and every church needs to understand these words of Jesus are not a request. These words of Jesus are not a suggestion. 
these words of Jesus are a non-negotiable command. Every Christian has many commands we're supposed to obey as Christians. We're commanded to read and study and learn the Bible. We're commanded to pray. We're commanded to give. We're commanded to assemble ourselves together. We're commanded to love one another. We're commanded to look for the second coming of Christ. So many commands, and I want to say this last command is certainly one of the most important. When he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Make no mistake about it now. Are you listening to me? If we're not involved in missions, it's a sin if you're a believer. If you're not involved, it's a sin. The Bible said in James 4, 17, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. It's a sin if we're not involved somehow in some way. And by the way, when Jesus said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to the only creature, there's only one way to obey that command. I cannot go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But Jesus told me to do it. How am I going to do it? The only way I can do that is I've got to be in a good church. I've got to be in a good church that's a missionary-minded church. I've got to be in a good church that loves missionaries, supports missionaries, help to send missionaries, gives, so missionaries can go. And I have to participate in that. And when I participate in that, that's the only way I can go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you and I must never forget this. It's not what I can do by myself, but it's what I can do with my church family. It's what we can do together. Rescue the perishing. Why? Because sinners are perishing. Rescue the perishing. Why? Because God is commanding. Rescue the perishing. Why? Number three. Because the field is calling. All right. Now we're in Acts 16. Paul and Silas, probably Luke and Timotheus, and maybe a few others, they're on a second missionary journey. Paul has what we call the great Macedonian vision in Acts 16. And he sees a man across the Aegean Sea. That's over into Europe. He sees a man across the Aegean Sea over in Europe saying, Come over and help us. Come over and help us. And the Bible said, After that we immediately endeavored that the Lord hath called us to preach the gospel unto them. And they got on board a ship and went across the Aegean Sea. And for the first time in Europe, they took the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and lit the gospel lamp over in Europe. Amen. That man of Macedonia was the field calling, come over and help us. Now, there's a harvest of souls, I want to say, ready to be reaped. And the field is calling. Jesus said in John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. The field is calling. Missionaries tell us about people who walk miles and miles to find them, to ask them to please come back to their village, come back to their town, to preach the gospel to them. My wife and I used to go to the mission field almost every summer. When I pastored up in Wichita Falls, my church would send us to the mission field, and we'd be gone for 20 days, and we'd go off into Central America and South America, and we'd go visit our missionaries, and we'd go look at their work, and I'd preach for them. We've been all over Central and South America. And I remember we were in Colombia one time in the city of Medellin, the cocaine capital of the world. And I remember this Colombian pastor with tears coming down his cheeks the last day before we were to leave and come back home asking me, please, please come back to my country. Come back to my people. Come back and bring the gospel to my people. And my heart broke, but I had to tell him I can't. It's the will of God for me to stay where I am in Wichita Falls, Texas and pastor Bible Baptist Church here. The field, I want to tell you, is calling. 
And I can hear them today saying, come over and help us. Like this man of Macedonia, come over and help us in Acts 16. The field is calling. I can hear them calling from the mud huts in the rainforest along the Amazon River where I've been. I can hear them calling from the big cities in Brazil where we've been like Manaus and Belém and Salvador and Rio and Sao Paulo and Brasilia. I can hear them calling from Colombia, Medellin and Bogota. I can hear them calling from Ecuador where we've been in Quito and Santo Domingo and Tuachi and Trente. Come over and help us. I can hear them calling from Honduras where we've been in Tegucigalpa and San Pedro Sula and La Esperanza and Intibuca and I can hear them calling, come over and help us. People from all over the field is calling. Long we have sought eternal life. Years we have waited in vain and strife. In darkness groped, sad miseries mate. How long, how long must we wait? The aged faint and long for a friend. Dark shadows gathering soon bring to an end. Fades now the light. Tis growing late. How long? How long? How long must we wait? I want to tell you, rescue the perishing because the field is calling. Oh, if the average North American Christian could just be given one week to go and visit some of the places my wife and I have been, I want to tell you it would revolutionize your Christianity. It would revolutionize your vision. It would revolutionize your zeal to send the gospel to the regions beyond. The poet said, if you were lost in darkness and night with no one to show you the way, would you want someone to bring you a light and wouldn't you want it today? If no one had told you of Jesus at all, his love, his compassion, his death, well, wouldn't you want the message to come before you had drawn your last breath? If sinking in evil traditions, you were bound by what you believed, Helpless and hopeless, or wouldn't you want a chance at least to be freed? Would you want them to wait while they builded new homes and paid for a still better car? Or while making the home base an elegant place before sending the message afar? Would you want them to table the plans that were made to expand on missions this year because of the conditions around the world and the days of uncertainty here? Would you want them to wait for the message of hope while you were dying and lost? Oh, I know that your answer would ring through the gloom. Please send it at any cost. So let's send it out to the millions in need, the light that will show them the way. For if it were you in the darkness at night, you'd want it. You'd want it today. Rescue the perishing because sinners are perishing. Rescue the perishing because God is commanding. Rescue the perishing because the field is calling. Let me give you this thought. Number four, rescue the perishing because hell is pleading. Now we're in Luke 16 again. Jesus has given the story of the rich man in Lazarus and Lazarus died and went to heaven. He was carried off by the angels into Abraham's bosom, bosom paradise. The rich man opened his eyes in hell. And we find that there was a conversation that went on there. And the rich man, please send someone, Lazarus, just a dip of water on his finger to come and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Abraham said, hey, no, we can't do that. And the rich man said, please send somebody to my home. Please send somebody to my five brothers and warn them lest they come to this dreadful place. Hell is pleading. Hell is pleading. For us to rescue the perishing. I mean, if God would draw back the curtain between us and hell, then let us see hell for 30 seconds. We'd see people from every country, people speaking every language. And those people would plead with us to send someone to their loved ones and friends. They'd give us names and addresses. They'd tell us how to find their villages back in the mountain. They'd tell us how to find their villages down on the river. And they would plead with us like this rich man in Luke 16. Please send someone. Oh, I pray today that God would give us spiritual hearing so we could hear the pleadings and the groanings of the eternally damned in hell that plead for us to send someone to rescue the perishing. 
Rescue the perishing. Sinners are perishing. Rescue the perishing. God is commanding. Rescue the perishing. The field is calling. Rescue the perishing. Hell is pleading. Let me give you this thought before we leave. Rescue the perishing because heaven is encouraging. And by that I mean heaven is encouraging us to do so. Now we're in Luke chapter number 15. And in Luke chapter number 15, Jesus tells the story of the one lost sheep that the shepherd went to find. And then he tells the story of the woman who lost her coin and then it was found. And then he tells the story of the prodigal son who finally came back home to the father. And in those stories, Jesus said, there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. More than over 90 and 9 which have already been saved and need no repentance. You see, heaven is interested in the salvation of the lost. And heaven is encouraging us. Are you saved? The Holy Spirit lives in you. I'm up here preaching the truth. And there's something inside of you that's saying, he's telling it right. And there's something inside of you that says, I know that's true. And there's something inside of you that says, yes, that's right. Heaven is encouraging us to rescue the perishing. Heaven, let me say it again, is interested in the salvation of the lost. Why? I believe it adds to their celebration. It adds to their rejoicing. When a lost man in Wiley, Texas, or Pantego, Texas, or Bogota, Colombia, or, or, or uh, 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 Salvador, Brazil, or some mountain village in Mexico, in Monterrey, or, or, or Saltillo, comes to Christ. There's joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. And so heaven is encouraging us today. Do it. Witness, hand out tracts, write letters, make phone calls, invite someone to come to church, tell somebody about Jesus, send missionaries, be a missionary. Heaven's encouraging us. Rescue the perishing. It adds to their celebration. I believe, I don't think, I don't think the people in heaven spend a whole lot of time watching us. And I don't blame them. I don't think the people in heaven spend a whole lot of time looking over the ramparts of heaven and what's going on down on earth. But I do know this. I believe they're informed whenever there's a spiritual victory in your life. I believe they're informed whenever some lost soul gets saved. That has to be true because Jesus said there's joy in heaven when a sinner repents. Whether he's a North American sinner, Central American sinner, South American sinner, European sinner, Asian sinner, whatever. You know, I, I said when I started, I know it's time for me to quit, y'all. I'm looking for the runway. I'm going to land it here in a minute. Just stay with me. I'm getting hungry, too. I said when I started, I've been preaching 51 plus years. It'll be 52 the years, the first Sunday in October. I got saved while I was in the military, called to the ministry two months later. I never knew this until I had been preaching for 20 years. I had a grandmother, my mom's mom, who was a great Christian woman. She taught Sunday school. She loved the Lord. And she had always prayed for a preacher. I never knew that until my mother's sister, my Aunt Dot, Dorothy. My mama died when I was 20 years old. And so mom wasn't around to tell me this. But my mom's sister said to me, my Aunt Dot, she said, David, mom, my grandmother, always prayed for a preacher in the family. And she had two boys. Uh, they, they weren't preachers. No. And then there was an older grandson, older than me, and he didn't make a preacher. But she said, when you were born, she said, I took mom to the nursery window to see you inside landing there in your crib. Just a newborn. And she said, Mom looked at me and said, That's my preacher. I never knew that till I'd been preaching for 20 years. Now I believe this. I believe the day I walked down the aisle and surrendered my life at an old fashioned Baptist altar to go into the ministry and to be a preacher. 
I believe my grandma Wilson was informed in heaven. And it added to her celebration. And it added to her rejoicing. And I want to tell you, when a sinner gets saved, the Bible said there's joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. Rescue the perishing. Because heaven is encouraging. And then I have this last thought. We need to rescue the perishing because time is passing. The Bible said in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The Bible said in James 4, 14, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth. The Bible said, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That's the unsaved. Redeeming, making good use. Redeeming the time. You see, time is passing. Our time is limited. Seemed like just the other day my wife and I got married. In September, it'll be 54 years. Time is passing. Seemed like just the other day I got out of the military. That was 54 years ago. You can think about things when it seems like just the other day. Time is passing. And the truth of the matter is, today is really, are you listening to me? Today's really all we've got. We have no promise of tomorrow. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can work. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. And we need to remember we're stewards of everything we have, and that includes our time. And we only have a certain number of years and we only have a certain number of opportunities. And God's plan for the ages, I believe, is drawing to a close. And there are still millions upon millions who've never heard one time the name of Jesus Christ. And those of us who are saved, if we're ever going to get involved in this work of rescuing the perishing, it needs to be now. Today, this is all we've got. The poet said he was going to be all that a mortal should be tomorrow. No one, would be, no one would be kinder or braver than he tomorrow. A friend who was troubled and weary he knew would be glad for a lift and he needed it too. He would call on him and see what he could do tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up the letters he'd write tomorrow. He thought of the folks he would fill with delight tomorrow. It was too bad indeed he was busy today and he hadn't a minute to stop on the way. More time he'd have to give others, he'd say, tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow. The world would have known him had he ever seen tomorrow. But the fact is he died and faded from view and all that was left when his living was through, was a mountain of things he intended to do tomorrow. I want to say this before I quit. You and I must never forget this. Are you listening to me? The only thing that's going to matter when life is over. Number one, were you saved? Number two, what did you do for Jesus? After you got saved. That's all that matters. He's not going to be impressed by how much money you made. He's not going to be impressed by how many friends you had. He's not going to be impressed with whether or not the world thought you were a success. Only two things are going to matter. Number one, were you saved? Number two, what did you do for the Lord after you were saved? Rescue the perishing. Paul said... I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Rescue the perishing. This, and we'll have an invitation. I remember my wife and I one time were in Ecuador visiting missionaries. We went out to this little village called Trenta, which means 30. They went out into the jungle. They cut out a big circle out of the jungle, perhaps a mile, and built a town and called it Uno. One. Then they went another three or four miles and cut a big circle out of the jungle and built a town and called it Dos. Then they went another three or four miles, cut out a big mile out of the 
jungle and called that city Tres. We went to 30. I thought we were never going to get there. We got to this little clearing out in the jungle. Oh, there was a little block building that served as their meeting place. And the missionary, Mel and Charlene, Neal and Vicky and I were standing there. And here would come people out of the jungle walking to church. And here'd come a family, a man and his wife and maybe a couple little kids. And Mel said to me, you see that couple? They just walked four miles through the jungle to get here tonight. And here'd come, here'd come some more and he'd say, you see those? They just walked three miles through the jungle to get here for this service. We went in a service that night and uh, I don't know, there was probably 50 or 60 people there. And I was up there preaching. While I was preaching, this bat flew in the back door. Had a wingspan about that big. <laughs> big old bat. He flew in that back door. He came right down that center aisle. He didn't get at the altar. <laughs> he came right down that center aisle. He went around my head about four or five times while I was preaching. Went right back up the center aisle and out that back door. And I told the people, that's El Diablo. It's the devil. We got through preaching, gave an invitation. This little 16-year-old girl stepped out, came down the aisle with tears coming down her cheek and said, I need to get saved. I want to be saved. And the missionary led her to Jesus Christ that night. And I want to tell you, I led that, left that, my wife and I left that service tonight, and I felt more compelled. I felt more... Uh, more dedicated, I felt more determined to go home and do anything and everything I could to rescue the perishing. That little old gal made it all worthwhile. She made it worthwhile to go to Ecuador. She made it worthwhile to go through the jungle all the way back to Trenta. And I left determined I'm going to stay in this. I'm going to do everything I can to rescue the perishing. Now what about you? Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, truth is I've never been saved. You're just as lost then as some person in some jungle somewhere or back up in some mountain canyon. Jesus came for you. He lived for you a perfect sinless life as your substitute before God's law. He went to the cross and he died for you and he took your sins upon himself and he died in your place and he paid your sin debt to God. He rose from the grave on the third day and now you can have a new life. If you'll admit you're a sinner and you need a Savior, and you understand Jesus Christ is God's appointed way for men to be saved, God's Son came and did it all for you. And if you'll come and admit you're a sinner, there'll be people here to pray with you, people here to help you, people here who know what to do, I'm sure. And you step out in a minute when we give you the opportunity. You're among friends. Nobody make fun of you. You're among friends. We'd do it for you if we could. But we want to help you, want to pray with you, want to lead you to Jesus Christ today. Jesus will save you if you ask him. He'll change your life for good forever if you'll ask him. He'll forgive your sins. You don't have to go to hell. Don't die and go to hell. You don't have to. Jesus lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He'll save you today. And you come. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm a Christian. I know the Lord. God's spoken to my heart today. Oh, listen. I'm going to do more for missions this year. Maybe you say God's been tugging at my heart and he wants me to go to some mission field somewhere. What better time, what better place than here and now to come bow to an old altar and surrender your life to full-time Christian service. I promise you'll never be sorry. It's preaching stuff's the best in the world. I don't want a real job. God might send you to the mission field and let you lead people to Christ. God might let you be a preacher here in the States. Don't just spend your life. Invest it. Invest it in the greatest work in the world. Thank you for your patience with me today. Let's stand together. Father, I pray you be pleased to speak to our hearts. Bless it this invitation time. Lord, start right here with this preacher. Lord, help us never forget this. You love us. I don't understand it, but we're thrilled about it. You love us. Jesus came for us. Jesus saves us. Jesus gives us a real reason to live. 
something to serve and believe in and invest our lives in that's going to matter in eternity. Lord, thank you for this good church. Thank you for the, for the a church that even have a missions emphasis month. And Lord, I pray you'll do your work in the hearts of your people here. Lord, I pray that you'll help them to stay faithful. I pray you'll help them to be able to do even more all for the glory of Jesus. Lord, if there's someone amongst us today who's never been saved, I pray you'll help them to know you love them, you care about them. We love them. And we'd love to pray with them and lead them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Maybe someone whose heart you've been tugging on, I pray you'll help them to respond today before it's too late. Have your way in this invitation time and we'll thank you for it. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Colt. I invite you to come as we sing page 524, Freely, Freely. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. Said freely, freely, you have received freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. All power. wonderful message. Thank you very much for that, Brother Bryant. Thank you for coming and preaching for us today. Amen. Let us do a better job. Rescue the perishing. Fantastic. Timely message. Thank you for being with us today, guests and, and members alike. Um, Brother Bryant and Miss Vicki, if y'all go ahead and make your way to the back so those, uh, so we can greet you in those, give you a fist bump or an elbow. And uh, thank you for being here again. Let's go ahead and, uh, and pray. We'll be dismissed. Um, don't forget to drop off your uh, tithes and offerings in the back in the offering plate. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Help us just to keep this in the forefront of our minds to rescue the perishing. Lord, there are people going to hell. Souls going to hell for eternity. Lord, help us just take a little time out of our days, out of our busy lives. We can share the gospel. Lord, help us just to, to give so that others can go in our stead around the world. They're dying. Lord, just keep it in our minds that these are people just like us, that we're on their, on their way to hell, Lord. And Lord, just help us to, to do our part so that they can go to heaven so they don't have to suffer forever. We thank you for those that are here. Just bless us as we go about our lives. Help us just to live for your glory and for your honor. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.